welcome to the Get Over Yourself podcast. This is author and athlete Brad Kearns discovering ways to be healthy, fit, and happy in hectic, high-stress modern life. So let's slow down and take a deep breath, take a cold plunge, and expertly balance that competitive intensity with an appreciation of the journey. That's the theme of the show. Here we go. An Ironman triathlete training two to three hours a day at vigorous intensity, you're already doing like five, six times as much as we have ever done on a regular basis as, you know, as we evolved. You know, there's, there's no, um, I don't think there's, there's any uh, ancestral group that asks as much of their bodies on a regular basis as the, mo- as the modern athlete does. You know, subjective feelings, subjective quality of life uh, is actually one of the best things that you can track if you're able to actually be, be mindful of that. And, you know, particularly if we're talking about sports. I want to recognize my wonderful show sponsors. This is stuff I really use and enjoy, and maybe you will too. Ancestral supplements provide grass-fed liver, organ meats, and bone marrow in a convenient gelatin capsule so you don't have to cook liver. Wild Idea Buffalo is grass-fed, locally raised on the Great Plains for the last 130,000 years. Quit eating that junk food feedlot cattle and get some quality meat with Wild Idea. DNAFit.com offers cutting-edge genetic testing and customized diet and exercise recommendations. GOY30 is the discount code. Integro Probiotics is a unique, high-potency, handcrafted liquid probiotic called Flourish, so your microbiome can flourish. An Almost Heaven Sauna. Beautiful saunas for home use made of real wood, shipped to your door and easy to assemble. 200 degrees puts me at ease. Hi, Brad Kearns, introducing my main man, one of my favorite health leaders, Dr. Tommy Wood. First time meeting in person, have engaged with him wonderfully for the past year with his Nourish Balance Thrive program and his sidekick, Chris Kelly. And these guys are doing fabulous cutting edge work. Tommy's a young, enthusiastic guy, but man, he has been in the mix and extremely well trained. He's a qualified medical doctor, studied at Oxford in Cambridge. He got his PhD in neonatal brain research from the University of Oslo and then made his way over to the Seattle area. Both he and his wife Elizabeth do kind of professory stuff over at UW. That's the University of Washington, if you're not familiar with Seattle lingo. Uh, So his role with Nurse Balance Thrive is the chief scientific doctor and he engages with these clients like me to evaluate a comprehensive battery of tests to look at all these functional issues in your blood, urine, saliva, stool, and then give expert advice and commentary. And if you've listened to my Primal Endurance podcast, you've heard me talk about him many, many times, including having a show or two with him and also Chris Kelly. Uh, But this guy really set me straight and on to an enlightened path with my keto, low-carb, primal journey when he made the observation, this is back in September of 2017, so I'm a year into this kind of new experiment inspired by Tommy and Chris, where he looked at my athletic goals, right? I'm an old guy trying to do magnificent athletic feats still, break world records and so forth, uh, enjoying my ketogenic experience and my ease at fasting for long periods of time. But he made the observation that, hey, if my ideal body fat is there, if I have good blood numbers, no risk factors for disease, as is so common with carbohydrate dependency eating, that there might be another paradigm here to explore, which would be to consume more nutritious food to fuel my performance and recovery. So we get into some of these concepts in the podcast about the varying approaches and the customization and the importance of self-experimentation when you're doing things like low-carbohydrate eating or dietary transformation. And there's a lot of science dropping into uh, Tommy's uh, commentary, but he always brings it back to simple, actionable insights. And that's what's so cool. He talks about the importance of socializing and having positive social interactions, referencing 
uh, respected scientific research that this promotes longevity. Uh, the importance of owning a dog because the dog gets you outside. You're motivated and obligated to get fresh air, open space, and dogs know how to play all the time. And he's describing how important it is and how he loves to play with his dogs. And man, when I arrived at his house, I was greeted by one of the most magnificent animals on the planet, an all-white boxer. Boxer being maybe my favorite breed. Uh, my nephew, Stanley, Stanley the Boxer, I call him my nephew also, is just the most fantastic dog. And these guys are hilarious. They're full of energy. And then they go lie down and crash and be super mellow. Uh, but this white boxer, oh my gosh, what a vision. And Tommy explained to me that the snobby, stuck-up AKC, the American Kennel Corporation, the people that uh, verify dog breeds and hold those dog shows like the Winchester Show, they don't recognize the white boxer. Can you believe that? They don't recognize. They dish this beautiful animal. So forget those guys. This is the leading breed on the planet. And man, this guy was capable of playing. His name's Bruce Bowen, named after the great San Antonio Spur. And so that's the kind of fun we had on the conversation with Tommy. We got deep into it and then built up some momentum for a show number two. So let's hear what Tommy has to say about all manner of living healthy, being sensible, taking those low-hanging fruit like improving your sleep habits, smiling more, socializing, and getting out of that nitpicking and that controversy about whether this diet's better than that one or the deep particulars of how many carbohydrate grams you're eating in a day. Great stuff from show number one with Dr. Tommy Wood. Dr. Tommy Wood, I'm here in this beautiful Linwood, Washington. I knew I was getting close to your house when I saw the the farm fresh duck and chick duck, chicken, goose, ostrich eggs, fresh <laughs> fruit. I'm like, all right, healthy land. So yeah. we've landed here. Thanks for meeting with me. Oh, and you just coming. came in from Europe or something last night? Oh uh, no, I was at the Ancestral Health Symposium in Bozeman, oh, that's Montana. Right. Yeah. yeah. How'd that go out there? Oh, it was great. It was a it was a good conference. It was uh, smaller than the AHS has been in the past, I think, but it was great to see some friends, see some great talks. Um, and I, I spoke and it was, yeah, I think it was it was really good. We had a, the whole uh, crew from Nourish Planet Thrive were out there, so we all stayed in, in a big sort of ranch house together and hung out and recorded some podcasts and just oh, generally geeked out uh, about health. So, yeah, it was a lot of fun. That's special because you guys are all remote, your team, yeah. so that's the best reason to go. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay, you told me on the other podcast, uh, we go to these conferences, this, we say the same thing to the same people, <laughs> and I, I, I believe it does have that really important aspect of just building the community and the momentum. I went to Paleo FX for the first time after turning it down seven years in a row, mm -hmm. and yeah. you know, from when it was small to now it's this crazy thing, yeah. and I was so excited to be there and like, look at all these Paleo people. Everyone's <laughs> like, yeah. Uh, so that part's good, um, but at the same time, what I like about you and, and Chris and that, especially the podcast you're doing and the message you get out is even though you're the, the, the ultimate science-y guy and doing these postdoctoral studies and these intense you know, medical and scientific uh, realm, you're always getting out that, uh, that inspiration to look into things like socializing more, resting, taking time away from screens, and how that uh, promotes longevity. So I thought we could talk about some of that fun stuff. Yeah, great. We can we can take off your science hat a little bit, but I know it's gonna <laughs> it's gonna drip in here and there because when we talk about socializing, and then we talk about the effect on the on the hormones and the uh, the you know the actual health impact of doing these things that we kind of just talk about breezily. Yeah. So, I mean, you can you can dive into to any part of that, but I think one of the one of the things you notice that the more time you spend working with, you know, the optimizers we might call them. So they're the guys, you know, they might be in the biohacking realm, or you know, they've definitely discovered you know keto and low carb and all these other things. And there's there's this point where you get hyper focused on the details. And, you know, you th you're thinking about supplements and you're especially focused on diet and maybe you think about exercise too, but there's this, all these other things that, that, that are probably more important. And we, we, you know, we joke about the fact that you see these guys on Facebook 
and they're awake at two in the morning discussing about like how much carnitine they need to improve their performance on keto and in reality if they just went to bed at 9 p.m then they probably wouldn't need to be keto and they wouldn't need to take carnitine in the first place so there's this whole kind of you get hyper focused on the details and then you forget that you're a human being that you know evolved in light and dark with a normal circadian rhythm and surrounded by all these people in real life rather than on facebook and there's some really interesting studies that show how if you're socially isolated it has very distinct effects on on your physiology and it makes a lot of sense again from a sort of like if we take the ancestral perspective the evolutionary lens and this is actually a story uh my friend and colleague uh, dr brian walsh tells and if you imagine that you're in uh a group setting uh, maybe you're, you're a hunter-gatherer tribe and you live in the forest uh, wherever that might be and when you're surrounded by you know, all these people you're at risk of certain diseases you know communicable diseases things you might get from from other people in your environment but equally you know deep down on some level that if you get sick there are people to look after you so actually your level of inflammation is overall much lower because you don't need to look after yourself if you get sick somebody can look after you then if and and this is borne out you know in the research you can measure these things in the blood but sort of for argument's sake we'll just go with the story and then if you imagine that the tribe gets attacked and you're alone in the forest um all of a sudden you have to take care of yourself and if you trip over something or cut your leg you know you, your immune system is gonna is is gonna have to be hyper vigilant to you know get on top of that whatever it is that you might get exposed to so then all these various um, factors get upregulated and various inflammatory factors uh, get upregulated because you're going to need that. There's nobody to look after you now. So you just have to you have to take care of yourself and the immune system um, sort of uh, takes that into account. And that, you know, in, in the long term can have serious detrimental uh, effects on your health, a sort of upregulation of the immune system. So it's an evolutionary adaptation when you're socially isolated. Um, but when you know, you're somebody who's trying to live a long and healthy life um, that is going to potentially be uh, or can potentially contribute to things like metabolic disease, uh, certain cancers, uh, just because like the effect of being socially isolated. So it's again, it's an evolutionary adaptation. But then when you take, you know, we are uh, we, we evolved in a certain way when we we evolved to be social beings and when we're not um, surrounded by people who love and support us and we know can care for us, um, then that has direct effects on our physiology. So if I have a lot of Facebook friends, does that count or, or am I possibly socially isolated if I'm all I'm doing is engaging with uh, people in a, in a digital realm? Yeah, that's, that's a really good question. And I think... Um, you, you could certainly get some benefits from Facebook. And, you know, there's um, if, you, if you think about, again, the, the sort of realms that, that, we, um, that we inhabit. So uh, paleo, ancestral health, uh, low carb or keto, you know, any of those things. When you when you first find out about that and you want to try and uh, uh, incorporate it into your lifestyle, it's very likely that the people around you aren't going to do that. Right. So, you know, or at least it's, it's going to be new to them and it's going to be this thing that you're, you're doing on your own or you're sort of like learning about it to begin with. And then an online community can really help you mm -hmm. with that. So they can certainly give you support. And there's some great uh, groups where people can do that. However, you know, so there's definitely benefit there. But, that, but that's not the same as having loving, committed friendships, relationships. You know, somebody on Facebook could give you great advice about what to do with your diet. Um, but, you know, when something really bad happens or you get sick or, you know, you go into debt or whatever, you know, all these kind of things can happen to us. They're not going to show up and, and help you out. Right. So it's, it's just a different kind of it's a different kind of interaction. So it can certainly be beneficial, uh, but it's definitely not a replacement for, you know, real life, real life interaction. Yeah, we looked into that Dunbar's number that the uh, the scientist Robin Dunbar mm -hmm. talking about social aspect, and he he theorizes that we can only manage a maximum number of uh, social relationships at 150 due yeah. to the size of our brain, mm -hmm. and that happened to coincide with hunter gatherer band size and medieval farming village size was maxed out at 150, and so he's making that argument today, and we're managing way more than that because of the digital technology. But he also talks about these things, uh, the intimate circle and the social circle and the intimate circle is your really tight small group quite often family not necessarily because you get to pick 
but spending the majority of your social time nurturing that intimate circle and then a little bit more time uh, f- with the larger social circle, which might be your golf buddies or mm-hmm. your colleagues at work. Uh, and it, it, it was really interesting to think about because you know we have that opportunity to prioritize the relationships that we like the most and spend time with the people we like the most. doesn't have to be family. It yeah. doesn't have to be work colleagues. You could punch out and say, see you guys later. Uh, I, I love working with you, but um, I want to spend all my time somewhere else. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I think we get drained of those opportunities because of the overwhelming amount of social uh, yeah. media uh, obligations that we have. Yeah, and particularly if your uh, if your business is largely online which is definitely uh, uh, very common nowadays mm-hmm. that's certainly that that's certainly the fact for for us I know you know various things that you guys do have you know have an online component and online groups and things that have to be managed and looked after and people to talk to and emails to answer and those uh, those pressures are always there and I, you know I can't say I'm always great at balancing that it's it's something that you know you really have to work on so finding ways to um, to turn that off and make sure you focus on spending time with be it your friends or your loved ones the people you live with um, you know that, that's that's really important and, and how, how you how you do that is is obviously very individual but it's very important to, to make sure that you carve out that time right so I guess you can still be an introvert that likes small group settings and have three or four close friends in your town, or you can be this person who's joining the the bowling league, mm-hmm. the, the the golf uh, group, uh, the wine club, and be running around like crazy, constantly engaging in social opportunities, and it's just whatever feels right to you. So there's no hard and fast rule there. No, I, I don't think so. There's certainly no, um, you know, if if, if we try and see whether there's something from from the research or or looking back through the evolutionary lens i don't don't think we can definitely say that one particular pattern is going to be the thing that you have to do um there is some interesting research that suggests that if you're a man getting married uh is good for your health and longevity but it doesn't work for women so women who get married don't live longer but men who get married married do so um that's just it's just an interesting fact so too busy taking care of uh, <laughs> yeah. this you know undeveloped man who has uh-huh. to be constantly guided through life i guess yeah exactly Oof. having 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 the the burden of, of a guy to you know sort of drag through life exactly so 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 we can benefit from that but the the ladies maybe not it's just a uh, an interesting we'll, thing. we'll be trying to make up for it for the yeah. rest of our days then you know don't yeah. don't be a burden yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. um so you mentioned inflammation it seems so many of the conversations it seems like all roads lead to inflammation and this chronic inflammation that we're talking about. So in terms of the, the studies about socializing and how it affects the cortisol is that prominent stress hormone. I'd like to talk about that too, Mm -hmm. because that's the thing that's driving this chronic inflammation is the chronic overstimulation of the fight or flight response, which was designed to be brief and uh, maximum effort and then down to a, a recalibration of you know generally more mellow life and mm-hmm. now we've abused the heck out of that so how is that playing out and affecting our health yeah the, the important thing to to always point out is that you know inflammation is isn't a bad thing right inflammation is the body healing itself it's the process of the immune system dealing with whatever it is that you know it is the issue be it uh tr- direct trauma or a bacterial or viral infection or whatever and a muscle workout yeah uh, running in a sprint workout whatever you're yeah. calling upon inflammation yeah right? absolutely and one of the reasons why exercise is beneficial is because you get a short uh increase in inflammation which then decreases inflammation over over the long term um so inflammation isn't a bad thing it's part of the, it's part of the healing process but if you don't get rid of whatever it is that co- that's causing that inflammation the, then it then it causes causes issues so the um, if you think about uh, and cortisol too again cortisol itself isn't necessarily a bad thing but if you have h- high levels of cortisol for long periods of time you, you can become resistant to that it's like any hormone if you have high levels of insulin for long periods of time you can develop insulin resistance um so you can you can de- develop glucocorticoid resistance they call it or cortisol resistance and that's just again that process of being continuously exposed to it so the receptors in the body just decide to listen less they turn down the volume just because they're constantly being exposed to it and then you know cortisol itself is anti-inflammatory we give uh cortisone you know you have a cortisone cream if you have some kind of rash uh, we give it to people with autoimmune disease to try and damp down inflammation so cortisol itself is anti-inflammatory but then again 
being chronically exposed, you can then reduce the, uh, the, the benefit of that. So, so anything that um, you can be exposed to, and again, uh, it can be very individual, um, things in the diet, you know, we've talked about social isolation, uh, chronic exercise is something that we um, uh, certainly see a lot of, and that's actually what I talked about, or part of my talk at Ancestral Health Symposium was about sort of excessive exercise and training for modern sports and how that's uh, how that's it's a modern construct that we're actually asking things of our body that we were never really evolved to do and that can certainly be uh, in, inflammatory in, in a number of ways so there's, there's a number of different things that we're continuously exposed to and again in in, the, in a in a brief um, a brief exposure it can be beneficial you know just like a bit of exercise is great for you um, but you know too much of you can have too much of a good thing and that's often when when the problems start to develop so uh, you produce the cortisol in response to uh, your turn to speak at the Ancestral Health Symposium <coughs> or, or time to go hit the intervals in the workout. Mm -hmm. uh, the cortisol floods your bloodstream, the fight or flight response occurs. And so you're getting initially an inflammatory response. So in, in the short term, you know, if everything's working normally, then uh, cortisol, it's, it's, I mean, it's part of a number of different processes. So it's, it's partly there to help, you know, liquidate your assets, you know, make sure that <laughs> uh, blood sugar stays up to allow you to perform whatever it is you're trying to perform. It uh, is stimulating. So uh, people may know if they've ever taken exogenous cortisol, or if they've taken uh, prednisone tablets for some kind of um, uh, inflammatory process autoimmune disease you can't take it in the evening because it actually makes you it makes it sort of like wakes you up it's very um it's very stimulating uh so it does all of those things again it's part of that fight or flight response and uh it's also uh, acutely anti-inflammatory it can dampen down you know too much of an inflammatory response but that is that when it's continuously happening and you're not letting it it come down and it should have a normal daily rhythm plus you know some small fluctuations if you need to activate the fight or flight mm -hmm. response but if your uh your circadian rhythm is messed up and you're not letting that normal fluctuation or you're continuously stressed so maybe uh, you wake up and you're late for work and there's uh, traffic on your commute and then you hate your job and then um <laughs> then you go home and you like crush yourself on the bike because you're training for an iron man and you know, then you can never, you never truly switch off to go to, you know, to go to sleep properly. And then you become sleep deprived. And then, you know, that whole kind of cycle, um, it's just, you know, continuously having the sort of the on switch and pushing the accelerator and ne never having a chance to turn it off. But, you know, I imagine there's a lot of people where like, will will uh, identify with everything I do. You know, they're probably doing all of those things, right? They'll, they'll realize they're trying to do all of that stuff. You know, the job, there's whatever issues getting to and from work and there's whatever they're training for because they want to try and perform and then they you know cut the sleep short because they've got kids and dogs and whatever and it's just uh, a lot of the time we're just asking too much of ourselves so the what's the optimal daily rhythm for cortisol so it should it should peak um sometime between four and six a.m so just before you wake up and then it essentially should just come down naturally over the day uh until you until you go to sleep and then it'll peak again uh it'll peak again at night so you see this nice kind of spike in the early morning and then it will come down often people will uh you'll you'll see that the the slope of the curve is reduced slightly because maybe you have something like coffee which can affect the metabolism of cortisol uh, so again for some some people that may cause issues if they're having lots of caffeine um but that's that's the normal that's the normal uh, that's the normal daily rhythm. It should sp spike in the morning and then come down over the day. And if you're with all of those things, you know, continuously keeping it elevated, then you can. And it, it's part of you know we know everything in the body, or almost everything in the body has this sort of daily cycle, mm -hmm. and that's one of the things that controls many other processes. So if you're not letting it go up and come down, then you know there's a lot of knock-on effects. So if you're wondering what this, this hormone talk has to do with anything or you're, you're not following the science, uh, what, I, what, dis, what I discovered when I was an athlete was this, was this was everything. This was me figuring out the puzzle that was, you know, causing me to struggle and suffer. And I just could not understand why I could go, go, go and feel fantastic and do these great races and come home and feel fine the next day and get up and ride 73 miles and then come home and take a short nap and then go run. And it was because I was overproducing the stress hormones 
uh, overstimulating the fight or flight response. So in that short term, however long I lasted, I, I remember crashing and burning after six weeks of mm -hmm. awesome racing yeah. or um, a year of going fantastic and traveling all over the world. And then the entire next year, I'd wake up every morning and feel like crap. So I feel like this discussion is highly relevant to everyone out there who's pushing things hard and trying to cover all these check boxes in life, whether it's the busy, harried mom who's d trying to be be all and end all for her kids or balancing career and, and parenting or doing your athletic endeavors at the end of your hard, busy workday. So um, if we could figure out this puzzle on how to kind of uh, avoid that allure of mm -hmm. constantly calling upon the fight or flight response, knowing that it works and we will feel uh, pumped up yeah. if we put on the, the loud music and uh, our friends are there waiting, circling in the driveway, waiting for us to get on the bike and go hit it hard, even though you're kind of feeling drag ass. You're, you're, I, I like that um, quote, you're liquidating your assets. Yeah. Yeah. That's um, we can always liquidate our assets yeah. tomorrow and buy a new <laughs> boat because I just saw all these cool boats down at Lake Union, Lake Washington. I'm like, wouldn't that be fun to have a boat? <laughs> Gee, I guess I could buy a boat tomorrow if I tanked myself for the next, you know, screwed up my my operation big time. You know what I mean? Yeah. Okay, so we're liquidating our assets. Yeah, that, that's exactly uh, that's exactly it. And I, I think it's a Robert Sapolsky quote. Um, from uh, Why Zebras Don't Get Ulcers is one of his first books. He's, I mean, he's uh, a, a fabulous um, a neuroscientist um, ba based at Harvard. And but ba basically, that's that's what cortisol does: is it it takes whatever it is that you have stored up and tr makes it available so that you can do whatever it is you're asking your body to do right now. And when we activate those things, you're right, we can overcome a huge amount and we can feel great even as things are starting to fall apart. And that's just part of our re resilience as, as a species is what, what allows us to thrive in, in hard times, which we've done you know, many times in, you know, in many different scenarios. But, mm -hmm. you know, at some point, you're going to run out of those of those assets to, to work with. And then, you know, that's when you spend, you know, all this time having having, having to come back. So, it's much better to find balance before everything falls apart rather than have to sort of build people back up. And the building people back up is essentially what we have to do a lot of because there's just been this societal drive where, you know, you work 80 hours a week and you run marathons and you have kids and, you know, you buy all these things and, you know, all this kind of stuff that... Uh, you know, if you're a type A personality or somebody who's driven, the, these are the things you think you need to do in life. And eventually, you know, um, some people do fine. Don't get me wrong. But for most people, the, the wheels come off. Yeah, how do those people do fine? Are we just talking about genetic uh, aptitude for a, a grander life than the next person? I'm questioning, too. I've, I know I've talked to you a lot of times like, Tommy, what's going on? Because I feel like I have these crash and burn patterns in my life, despite careful attention to diet. I'm not overtraining or anywhere near those patterns that I used to be. Uh, but, you know, you can kind of get into a, a, a sh short term overdoing it in one way or another and then kind of feeling drag ass for a couple few days and then identifying that I need a lot more sleep than the average you know I take a poll of all my friends and if I find somebody that says yeah I need like nine hours I'm like really <laughs> seriously that's awesome tell me more uh, but is that genetic variation or yeah I, I don't know I, I it's just th th there's always the outliers uh, that for what and there's there's gonna be uh, certainly a, a genetic aspect but then there's also a, a cognitive aspect some people are just resilient to to you know a lot of uh psychological or social stresses and the i guess the the the, the reason that is 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 because there's there's no such thing as stress right it's just our response to whatever it is that's stressful so i guess so i i use the example of you know, hating your boss or the the traffic on the way to work when you're when you're when you're driving. Like one person, they'll like, they'll be super stressed about that. Like even though the, it's it's the same traffic every day, right? So it doesn't change. But every morning, it's just super stressful to just sit there, you know, slowly crawling to work. Whereas the person in the next car, it's like no big deal. I'll sit here, listen to a podcast. You know, I know it's going to be like this. It's not stressful at all. It's just part of the process. So there are just going to be people who are much more resilient to, to stuff like that. And we can make ourselves more resilient to that. You know, it's just a, it's a, how, how do you respond to those things? What your, what's your thought process? Are you able to just, you know, realize that it is just part of life and there's no point in getting stressed about it. And I, I think that's something that, that everybody can, can certainly work on. 
Um, but but again, when you uh, talk to the people who live the longest and healthiest lives, they certainly seem to be happy to to often be quite slow about things, right? And that's just about everything they do. And there's they realize that there's should be plenty of time and everything doesn't need to be done today. And if you can build in those periods of relaxation and spending time with family and you know slowing down to eat your food with other people and you know realizing that you probably don't need to race that that iron man you know next month you know all of that kind of stuff can can come together um to to then give you the long-term benefits yeah i guess that goes especially in the exercise realm if you go and respect that intuitive component which i'm always talking about with the athletes like Mm -hmm. you know if you don't feel like doing your planned workout I feel that's a very profound sign that you should pay attention to instead of turning on the little switch saying, you lazy ass, of course you don't feel like it. It's raining out. But I remember, uh, you know, weather and any sort of hardship didn't deter me one bit when I was motivated and excited to go train. And I had these daunting competitive goals that consumed me and I had so much enthusiasm for. Those were all positives. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, when I'm racing poorly, overtrained, uh, getting into this, uh, you know, n- not getting over myself, but getting too fixated on the business aspects of it. And was I getting enough paid from my sponsor? Uh, nothing, nothing motivated me to train because there was so much negativity involved. And that the same for example for the workplace or whatever. Yeah, and uh, you bring up a, a great point, which is sub, you know, subjective feelings, subjective quality of life uh, is actually one of the best things that you can track if you're able to actually be be mindful of that and. It, you know, particularly if we're talking about sports, um, one of the best ways to track the risk of overtraining or injury in athletes, you know, and better than, or at least as good as, if not better than uh, looking at blood markers, looking at HRV. If you just do a regular questionnaire asking athletes how they feel, how they sleep, there's there's lots of questionnaires that include things like um, digestion, uh, sexual function, mental health, all that kind of stuff. Um, that will tell you whether somebody's at risk of overtraining or injury just as well as sort of the fancy markers. So if you can be mindful of those things, and then you're just like, do you know what? I just don't feel like it today. And then you know, give yourself a day off rather than go and push yourself really hard. But like, don't get me wrong, I I certainly fell down the same traps that you were talking about before. It was just like you need to just get in there and crush yourself, and then you'll feel great after. Afterwards, but you know you get to a point where you sort of if you listen again everybody says listen to your body you, you kind of once athletes get you know maybe into their late 30s or into kind of you know the masters categories you'll always hear them say you know now i just sort of listen to my body and my training is much more <laughs> intuitive but i feel like you like most people seem to need like a decade or two decades of really really <laughs> suffering suffering to, to in order to figure that out Well, I'm also going to say that listen to my body is not quite all the way there Mm -hmm. because when I was in these high overstress periods, bathed in stress hormones because of repeated hard exercise, I listened to my body and my body said, let's go again, man, bring it on because I'm in that altered uh, chemical metabolic state. And so just to make sure everyone understands, so when you're saying like you're liquidating your assets, you're all of a sudden, with the snap of a finger, such as when a gun comes to your head or when they call the racers to the starting line, uh, you start to metabolize fatty acids really well, uh, bring the glucose, drip it into the bloodstream perfectly so that even if you're just switching over from the athletic analogy to uh, you're in a crisis situation in the hospital and you've been there on watch for 13 straight hours and someone says, you want to go eat breakfast? And you say, no, I'm, I'm not hungry. Mm-hmm. That's because you're in this wa- high wired state. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, absolutely. That's what it's, it's setting you up for. It's providing all of those fuels so that you can, you know, in, so that you can uh, perform whatever it is you need to perform. And, you know, historically it might be you know, run away or fight or hunt or something like that. And now it's um, the do do the job at work, hit a deadline, you know, do a workout. Um, and all of those are the, the, the amount of the amount of stress that we feel the way we respond. It's all it's always relative. Right. So what's uh, there? There are many people in the world who are exposed to far more stressful things than we are. Uh, however, like I said, it's relative. So I will get just as stressed as they do 
by something that's just stressful relatively to me. So the, the body will always, you know, you'll always have those have those exposures that will give you some kind right. of Right, I mean, like Tom Cruise is cracking jokes while he's doing a mission, uh, climbing up the side <laughs> of the, 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 the Burj in, in, uh, in Dubai, and he, he's totally chill. And all those great people we see in the uh, Top Gun and Maverick and Goose are, are joking over the radio. Yeah. But it, in literal terms, that's really important to, to respect. Same with the... Um, the, the, the workplace or even the, the person out there pedaling their bike beyond the heart rate is the stress impact of the workout based on your, um, your, your psychological state of health, I suppose. Yeah. And, and whatever so, it so is, get over yourself, basically <laughs> yeah. calm down, chill out, whatever you're doing. Yeah. You know, I always feel like, you know, people that they don't call in sick to work. It always bugged me. It's like, you know what? You're going to get us sick. Go home. I guarantee you the business will operate without you for one, <laughs> two, or three days. But that self-importance and that stress of dragging a sick body into the workplace so that you don't lose momentum is part of that, part of that mentality is taking us, taking us into, the, into the tank over and over. Yeah. And, but that's, it's kind of what, what, we're, what we think we need to be... Um, what we what we think we need to do again it's what, yeah. what we think society uh requires of us but yeah. you know with that with that same example you could probably think of the, all these other things that that person is doing that are probably going to increase their susceptibility to being sick and then they just they sort of like push through it which may actually be even more detrimental and sort of compound things but that's just you know the way things are currently set up for most people so when you're in this fight or flight hot wired state that's an inflammatory state. Your your elevated levels of systemic inflammation overall. You got heart rate, respiration, fuel usage. Uh, it, would you call that an inflammatory state? Um, in, in the long term, yeah. So so in in the short term, uh, potentially not. It depends what what else might be going on. So if you're if you're doing exercise mm. again, that you know is that is definitely inflammatory, uh, but with uh, positive consequences such as remodeling of the muscle tissues, uh, reducing um, reducing uh, basal levels of inflammation uh, sort of resets uh, the inflammatory processes or the immune system. So, so it, it kind of depends what else is going on. Uh, it's when uh, any, st but then any stimulus like that can become uh, chronically inflammatory because of um, you know, be it uh, resistance to certain things or a, an increase in certain mediators over time so again it's not that one thing is necessarily bad it's just that continuous exposure okay so i guess you could say when you're when you're in that fight or flight you are primed for peak performance yeah which is a thumbs up all the way around whether it's the speech uh in the workplace or the athletic event and then calling upon it too frequently then you i mean liquidating your assets is great when it's time to buy the 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 new boat yeah uh, but then when you have to get your bills paid the following week then you pay the price yeah okay yeah yeah exactly and i'm glad i went down to the harbor before the podcast to have this boat <laughs> analogy because i'm looking at this boat going man that's a nice boat you know <laughs> but so so that's exactly it you know we can liquidate some assets that allows us to perform well however you can't keep uh, going back to the well eventually eventually you're going to run out at some point you need to start saving again so that you can pay for you know pay for the boat payments right so that's the it's a well i, I paid cash for the boat okay well Did i tell you that well if oh, you no. pay if you, so, if you pay. So now what <laughs> what about my my rent mortgage food yeah yeah so so the um the i guess the the point is that there will always be a time where you need to start building back up or paying paying things off, right? And so you can accumulate huge amounts of credit card debt, um, or you can sell very you can sell everything you have so that you can buy the boat with cash. But then you know you, you may have had to sell stuff that you actually needed to use the next week. Um, so you know maybe you sold the car to buy the boat and then we can't get to work yeah. right or so 20 years later your your kids got no money for college yeah, yeah. exactly oh, is, yeah. so so the the analogy certainly make uh, it certainly makes a lot of sense you think about uh, all the it, it's all about um short term gain at the expense potentially of of uh, long term performance or long term health and i think you know, particularly going back uh, back to the well repeatedly um, in terms of sports performance or sports training, 
Um, that's the thing that that I, there's the it's the most tangible way to explain uh, what we see in people in terms of their their long term uh, health issues, and and it, but it doesn't need to just be it doesn't need to just be exercise. It can be. Um, it can be work stress, it can be financial stress, it can be social isolation, you know, all of those things compound one another. Um, and, and and then, you know, again, you end up at a point where you can't pay the bills. Yeah, my podcast with Joel Jameson, your neighbor down the road, mm-hmm. Kirkland, um, he was, you know, referencing that this stress at work, your studies, your relationship, your parenting roles, they all take energy, which means you have less energy to, to devote to training. Yeah, but I think a lot of uh, amateur enthusiasts have this notion that uh, their exercise is a great stress release from the other forms of stress in their life, and not realizing that these should all be on the same side of the the scales of justice. Yeah, and 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 you know, however busy you are with kids' soccer season, you literally have less energy to devote to training, and therefore you know, should prioritize recovery. But we don't like to hear that stuff on a podcast <laughs> yeah. or to our face. We just want to have it all and, and, and think that, well, this is totally different than my, my job's a desk job. So of course I can train for marathons. It'll be this wonderfully balanced uh, operation where I'm, I'm living the dream and living this balanced, healthy, fit life and also contributing well in the workplace. Yeah, I think that's one of the... Then the, they end up at Nourish, Balance, Thrive. Then man. they end up, yeah, so <laughs> keep doing it. Great, and then you can come and, come and be one of our clients one of our clients um well we always love working i mean the people we work with are are fabulous it's always so much fun but that i think that's one of the it's one of the biggest uh misnomers that um and a a big red flag usually for me when when you sort of ask somebody so what do you do for stress relief and they're like oh you know i go running huh i'm just not really sure yeah i'm that's not it's not doing what you think it's doing and yes you can feel amazing after you go running and you're going to get loads of uh, endorphins released. You're going to get a cortisol spike, which is, going to, which is going to make you feel great in the short term. But you're absolutely right. It, it all comes from that from that same from that same bucket. It all comes from the the same bank account. You can't, you know, you, you're still you're still using up the same resources as you were when you were getting stressed at work or getting stressed by by family or kids or whatever. So when when you're when you're using exercise therapeutically as stress relief you know in the long term that could, that can really start to cause issues yeah let's understand this endorphin thing too because uh i, I feel like we're in a age of you know we're a bunch of druggies talking to each other about that great fantastic feeling you have after your crossfit workout spinning class run and you're bathed in these chemicals that are uh, they're, they're painkillers like a, like an opioid mm-hmm. and so you get this short-term sensation that wow what a great idea that i did get my butt up at 5 a.m to do this workout because i feel buzz full of energy and enlightenment and and positivity after the workout but again, we're kind of calling upon this short-term chemical chemical reaction that can have negative long-term repercussions. Yeah, that, and if you think about uh, it, it's the set, it's, it's pro, the processes are all very closely linked. So if you think about any time you're asking your your body to get excited and perform, you are you know the, this whole host of things come together to make you feel good, right? That's the because. Uh, you know, if you if you think about the fact that maybe you needed to um, run away from a danger, or maybe you needed to run towards your next meal because you haven't eaten for mm-hmm. however long, if if you felt really crap and the, your energy was super low and you felt really unmotivated, then that stuff's just not going to happen. You're going to get caught by whatever's chasing you, or you're not going to catch whatever it is that you're trying to eat. And I mean, you just you, that that that's it. You, as, what, sooner or later, you, you, you're going to die. So we are designed uh, to feel good in that scenario where we really need to perform. However, uh, again, if if you if you look if you look back at uh, hunter gatherer populations and you look at their their activity patterns, they don't push their bodies for nearly as long or as hard as as we do as athletes almost on a daily basis. Um, and again, they have plenty of opportunities to to relax and spend time in whatever social community perform whatever ceremonies or you know all those other things that are part of the group that 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 we often sacrifice in order to try and uh perform particularly at sport but you know work is another great example 
Yeah, I like that. I, I came across this notion researching the Primal Blueprint years ago, and I, it was like a revelation to me, even though I shouldn't have been. It was just getting into my thick head, but uh, there's something was written where it said, uh, remember, our hunter-gatherer ancestors did the absolute bare minimum necessary <laughs> yeah. to survive. Uh -huh. And if they were trekking and migrating along the seashore, which which is uh, commonly the case, they had a shit ton of fish to eat, so they might have just sat around all day and played ancient chess and checkers because there was, no, there was none of this nonsense that we're doing now. So I guess this kind of transitions to um, what you talked about in ancestral health, and I love that insight that you offered. Again, was another like epiphany, like, Oh, yeah, because you were talking about dialing in carb intake for an athlete, and your yeah. starting point was, hey, wait a second, you guys. You realize this is a totally modern construct, yeah. so why should we compare to our ancestors did very well in keto and all this stuff? So yeah, what did you talk about, or let's, let's get more into that. Yeah, so, so I, the, the, my, my talk was, was about um, the athletes. It was, it was called The Athlete's Gut. Uh, uh, potential pitfalls of fueling for for modern sports, and it kind of uh, brought all of that stuff together and, and centered around the, the 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 issues with gut health that athletes often have, but then also the issues that we have in terms of the amount uh, of food that we're having to process if we're if we're you know very high intensity athletes, um, and you know the the total number of calories that have to go through that, and then also the effects, the direct effects that exercise can intense exercise can have on the gut, which is often uh, detrimental or, or negative, and so I, I started out um, and by looking at. Uh, some some hunter gatherer movement patterns and the 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 best research are probably that the Hadza like people talk about those you know those guys a lot and they've you know we've turned up and we've given them accelerometers and heart rate monitors and all that kind of stuff to sort of track their activity patterns and, <laughs> we've and, turned up yeah hey well, there's those guys again yeah it's, so you give them like a a three hundred dollar accelerometer and a bunch of uh, food or something that they really like. Yeah, yeah. I, I I I don't know. Obviously, how how those studies, you know, are, are sort of set up. But I imagine that it must be a very strange concept uh, to the Hadza when Western researchers <laughs> turn up with all their gadgets. And they're like, "Can we just plug you into all this stuff, and then please just go about your your normal day?" It just, I mean, I imagine those interactions are, are, are very strange for, uh, for for both sides. So if if you think about uh, again the the Hadza, where we have a lot of data. They spend maybe two to three hours at, at, at a level of activity that's like brisk walking. Hmm. So lots of walking around, you know, but equally, you know, lo lots of periods not, not doing that much. Uh, but less than half an hour a day of really vigorous intensity exercise, like what we would consider tr training or exercise, you know, going to the gym, getting on the treadmill, running as hard as we can for half an hour or lifting weights in the gym or anything like that. They're doing less than half an hour a day of that. So once you're... Um, an Ironman triathlete training two to three hours a day at vigorous intensity, you're already doing like five, six times as much as we have ever done on a regular basis as, you know, as we evolved. You know, there's, there's no, um, I don't think there's, there's any uh, ancestral group that asked as much of their bodies on a regular basis as the, mo as the modern athlete does. And so then when you're trying to think about fueling that um it's interesting that there seems to be an evolutionarily conserved total energy expenditure and it's about two to three thousand calories per day uh women on the lower end uh men on the higher end but also it's determined by fat-free mass so obviously you know there, there's some some intermixing in the middle and when you're a, a modern athlete particularly endurance athletes training multiple hours a day you're two to three times that so you're you're asking a lot more in terms of energy expenditure and you're asking a lot more in terms of the amount of calories that your body has to process so to to think that this is some kind of uh, ancest you know ancestrally relevant thing is just is just incorrect you're asking something that the body has never really been um been designed to do in, in the long term and that's probably why you know high level intensity uh, high volume athletes in the long term often develop a lot of health issues so that was that was kind of what what i was talking about is you know you have to start with the fact that modern sports and training for modern sports are a modern construct so we're you know we're just not necessarily designed to do that what kind of health issues are we seeing i know about the uh, cardiovascular damage especially in many of my old peers on the triathlon circuit 
and in the worlds of uh, elite cycling, high performing, even the amateur cyclists that have been going for years and years, uh, some of these articles are just uh, horrifying. The uh, one, one, one's called "One Foot in the Grave," <laughs> one's called "Running on Empty." There's another one with the cyclists, uh, and Leonard Zinn was the featured guy. There is a prominent. Uh, a guy in the cycling industry and a longtime racer where their hearts just blow out because of repeated overuse for years and decades. Yeah, so so cardiovascular is is probably the main one. And there's definitely uh, so, some contention on this. Um, James O'Keefe is obviously a cardiologist who's, who's published a lot on this uh, uh, with some with some other guys. And they're there, there's definitely an increase in in AFib risk in endurance athletes and there may also be an increased risk of, of frank cardiovascular disease because just of the, the the huge volume of like the inflammatory burden and the stress on the heart, you know, day in day out for decades. So, if you do this for a few years, you're, you're probably fine. But if you're one of those guys who you're a professional endurance athlete for you know decades and you're training twenty hours a week for decades, which there certainly are people doing. You know, there are some people who are like, I just need to run 10 miles every day. Um, and, you know, on that, you know, on that end of the spectrum, there certainly seems to be uh, the potential for an increased risk of cardiovascular disease. And then the the other thing that we see a lot of is, uh, is issues with, with gut function and uh, exercise, uh, particularly that kind of exercise, long periods around lactate threshold, you know, 70, 80% of VO2 max for long periods of time. Um that seems to be really detrimental on, on, on the gut, you know, particularly for runners. But if you, if you look at the if you look at the the literature, in general, uh, competitive endurance athletes at least seventy percent have some kind of gastrointestinal symptoms. Um, again, it's worse it's worse in runners, but you know everything from like nausea to vomiting, diarrhea, abdominal pain, you know, bloating, gas, all that kind of stuff. Almost every endurance athlete I know has had that at some point. And it's it's uh, there's a number of potential reasons. It could be uh, that you're uh, eating something that you're that, that you that doesn't agree with you. You know, often the things that we're told to eat as endurance athletes, you know, large volumes of processed carbohydrates can certainly cause issues with the gut. Um, but but then also uh, you're decreasing uh, blood flow to the gut directly. You also increase gut permeability with long periods of intense exercise, uh, especially if de- you know it's and it's made worse if you're dehydrated. So just like th- this constant stress on the gut every day, particularly if you're doing high volumes of, of, of high intensity exercise, um, intensity, a high intensity being sort of like a relative scientific term. So anything that would be you know, running or cycling or that kind of le- level of endurance training that in- that intensity, that's just, it's it's really hard for the gut. And actually there, there are a number of people who think that, and it would certainly make sense that the stress you're putting on the gut, the increase in gut permeability, the inflammation is then also tied into the issues with cardiovascular disease because you're increasing systemic inflammation, which can mm. then directly affect the heart. So it certainly seems to be connected in one way or another. So it's, it's just that that constant stress, which you know the heart, the gut have, have never really been exposed to. You know, we, we just have to accept that, you know, if, if you have to do it for short term performance, for whatever reason, you know, if it. You, you kind of give people a pass if it's their job and the the triathlon pays the bills. Um, but it, it, it's just something that we're, we're not adapted to. Jeez, I remember years ago uh, on, the, on the triathlon circuit and having this anecdotal insight that the digestive system was the first thing to go. Mm-hmm. It was the first thing to fall when you got into that overtraining pattern. And that proved true for me over and over where you just have some irregularity, whether it was... Uh, name it and it starts to get bad and then everything else falls apart like then your knee injury flares up again but it was so sensitive because of all the calories going down yeah that was the tough part yeah there's that so that uh brings up a really interesting point which is at at the if, if you again if we go back to subjective you know asking people about things so including their digestion um, it, it, the the best evidence is actually in, in female athletes, but there's a, a questionnaire called the Leaf Q, the Low Energy Availability in Females uh, uh, Questionnaire. What's uh, it called? Uh, Leaf Q. It's a it's a questionnaire. Leaf Q. Yeah, yeah. and that they in the run up to the, the 2016 Olympics in Rio, they uh, they did this questionnaire. I think it was mainly with Australian athletes and. This was the best predictor of uh, of injury at the Olympics was how you scored in this questionnaire. And there's a whole section on gut symptoms, you know, uh, all those kind of, you know, you know, 
either around the cycle or outside of the outside of the menstrual cycle and in um in women who have um uh, bad gut symptoms um that predicts uh, injury risk so it goes exactly so, it, so it's exactly what you just said but um the they're they're incorporating this into into questionnaires they're highly validated and they're actually seeing that in the research now is running worse because of the impact trauma is that the factor that makes it you you mentioned running is worse yeah, yeah. I, I think so it's this the this the, the uh, the gut is a lot more mobile when you're running just because it's it's moving up and down compared to a sitting down sport where it's a lot more, um, you know, uh, I guess it's just it's staying in place at least a lot more than, than when you're running. So that's the theory. That's part of the theory, at least. Yeah. So I guess becoming fat adapted would be a big help. So you don't require as many calories. Yeah. And uh, what else is a way to address this uh, burgeoning a uh, topic of gut health for athletes. Yeah, it's, so that that that's a great point, and I, and I definitely um, highlighted that in the talk. Is that if you can reduce your reliance on intra race nutrition, uh, and then also reduce your reliance on um, ha- you know having to pound protein shakes or recovery shakes, all those things, gels immediately afterwards as well, when the gut still isn't really primed to absorb oh, stuff. It's not, huh? Uh, no, because we are also told that the muscles are most receptive to reloading right away. And then this window of opportunity, I used to write about this and sell powder to athletes saying, you gotta go within 30 minutes of getting home and pound this smoothie. Yeah. Uh, so I, I believe there's scientific validation that your your glycogen reloading can take place efficiently right after, and then you sort of lose that receptivity. Yeah, so that that's true. The, the reloading glycogen stores sort of happens in two waves, is the initial one immediately afterwards, and then you know a slower a slower sort of second wave um, after an hour or two, and so I think that only matters if you're um, so if you're going to do a, a two a day and the second tr- workout of the day performance was really important like you needed to retrain with optimal glycogen stores then I would then I would worry about it if you're not going to train again to the next day you will absolutely reload those glycogen stores by the next day, even if you're keto. If you're well keto adapted, those glycogen stores will be replenished by the next day, even if you don't eat a lot of carbohydrates. So that, so I don't think you need to worry about immediate glycogen replenishment. If So I guess one, well, well, there, are, there are plenty of examples, but something like um, uh, a CrossFit athlete where they're going to have multiple events in a day, um, then you know getting that stuff in quickly is super important. But... There's you know, plenty of good data showing that immediately after intense exercise, at, well, during and after, you lose the you have a reduced ability to absorb this stuff. So if this stuff isn't being absorbed properly, it's hanging out in the gut. It's either being fermented by the gut bacteria, causing gas and bloating, or it's sitting there. It's drawing in water, and it has something called the osmotic effect, and then it causes diarrhea because there's more water in the gut. So. You, and there's, it's the same with both carbohydrates and with protein. So if you think about guys have a really hard workout in the gym, then they neck a protein shake, and then you have you know the the protein farts for the rest of the afternoon because actually you put that stuff in when the when the gut wasn't quite ready to start digesting and absorbing it. So waiting at least half an hour to an hour, um, I think is is a really good idea. And and again, if we think about both glycogen and then also protein. Uh, so after the talk, um, uh, somebody in the audience came up and was like, you know, the guy at my running shop is saying I have to have a protein shake immediately after my workout. And, you know, there's plenty of evidence to show that at least for the vast majority of athletes where the timing of protein intake isn't really going to have uh, much of a, uh, much of an effect, it's much more to do with the amount of protein you eat in the 24 hours after after mm-hmm. your workout rather than what you eat in that first 30 minutes. So giving that gut a little bit of a break um, before you start refueling, I think can, can be really beneficial. Um, so yeah, so f- being being fat adapted, so periods of low carb, uh, cycling low carb throughout your workouts, so like sleeping low, you know, where you drain glycogen stores overnight, then maybe you do a faster workout in the morning and then you refuel with carbs after that. So you've had like this 24 hour period where you're kind of low carb, training in a low, in a low uh, glycogen depleted state, that's going to sort of activate those fat adaptation pathways, but then you don't need to be glycogen depleted or low carb all of the time. You can sort of cycle through it. Um, then also uh, adapting your adapting your training. So we use a lot of periodized uh, or sorry polarized training. Mm. So uh, lots of pi- lots of time at like a really slow aerobic kind of math heart rate kind of style, um, and then some periods of very intense short bursts, short bursts, short sprints. 
Um, and especially in the in athletes with a long uh, training history, that works really well. You know, they've got that base, like they their uh, skills are really high. You know, that they they know how to move, and then they actually spend you spend a lot less time around threshold, which really seems to be you know punishing yourself at that kind of you know. Uh, 20 minute repeats at lactate threshold is like the worst thing you can do for your gut so if you're somebody who has like gut symptoms associated with exercise like skipping that bit and then doing some much shorter uh intervals and then some much longer aerobic work that that can really be beneficial too so you can restructure uh the diet cycle the carbohydrates and then also restructuring the training and maybe re reducing the training load you know maybe you have a lot of volume in there that you don't need and you can you can start to figure out um, other things that you can do um, or you know increasing recovery and all of that can then be beneficial um, beyond that sometimes we have to do some gut treatment protocols test the gut see if there's something in there that we need to treat um, and, and 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 we do that too but often you know looking at the training program and um, and, and the dietary approach, you know, that can be enough too. Oh my, I get to talk about my almost heaven sauna. This has been a life-changing acquisition that gives me easy and constant access to one of the most health-boosting therapeutic treatments imaginable, the sauna. Yes, of course, it's been a cultural tradition in Scandinavia and other cold weather countries for hundreds of years. Maybe it's your favorite part of your health club visit or your ski trip vacation resort. But what about if you had a personal sauna in your own home, in your garage, or your backyard? Check out almostheaven.com. They make these super attractive barrel-shaped saunas made of thick, solid wood. None of this fake stuff. It's super easy to assemble. They ship it in a kit to your door. You watch the video. You put it together. Get an electrician to wire it. And you're good to go. Turn the timer on. And 30 minutes later, you are in the hot, hot, dry, up to 180 degrees degrees Fahrenheit, and that is the magic zone to get the vaunted health benefits of sauna exposure. You may have heard of these highly lauded heat shock proteins. They deliver profound benefits at the cellular level to boost immune function, cognitive function, cardiovascular function, improve muscular response to exercise and recovery from intense exercise, and of course, longevity. Go to foundmyfitness.com, Rhonda Patrick, and download her report for the extreme scientific details of how beneficial sauna is. I have this classic outdoor pinnacle model. It's six foot by six foot, fits four adults sitting comfortably or two adults reclining and instantly going into napping mode. I know, man, when you get in there, no matter what kind of day you had or what mood you're in, you will instantly feel chill. And this is called a hormetic stressor, a positive natural stressor that creates an adaptive response. So with regular sauna use, you become more resilient to all forms of stress that you experience in daily life. Same with my cold plunge into the cold freezer. It delivers these similar health and hormonal benefits that will make it an absolutely essential part of a relaxing, stress-balanced day. Please go check them out. It will change your life. And you can get these beautiful 6x6 six six or a larger model or even smaller for a surprisingly affordable price due to the direct relationship. You order it on almostheaven.com. They ship it to your door. I can't say enough about it. I'm so excited. This sounds like a commercial. Okay, it is a commercial. But let me tell you, beyond the health benefits... This is a social centerpiece. It's a place to relax and chill and splash the water on the rocks and get a burst of steam. So go pay a quick visit to almostheaven.com. Warning, you're going to be tempted. Hi, Brad Kearns, co-author of the New York Times best-selling Keto Reset Diet. And guess what? We have a fabulous, comprehensive, online, multimedia mastery course to help you go keto the right way. Mark Sisson and I, working on this book project, digital course, we are so happy because we realize that the hype and the popularity, the exploding popularity of keto comes with it a lot of misinformation and ill-advised approaches where people jump into this not knowing anything, not preparing properly, and struggle and suffer or have a brief short-term success, floating on stress hormones because of the extreme dietary transition without proper preparation, and then they crash and burn and go back to regular life or say, yeah, I don't think it's good for women or it's not good for athletes. So let's do something right for once when you're talking about a dietary 
monetary transformation, put the hype aside, get educated properly, and have a total immersive experience where we guide you with all the tips and information and education that you need to not only do it the right way, but know why you're doing it the right way. Our multi-stage approach is what distinguishes the Keto Reset from the Hype Shortcut programs. So first you undergo a 21-day metabolism reset where you ditch those terrible foods that are prevalent in the modern diet, the grains, sugars, refined vegetable oils, and you transition over to the ancestral style foods that are colorful and nutrient dense and not going to spike your glucose and cause an insulin rush and keep you in that carbohydrate dependency pattern, which is no fun and also will promote disease and aging. So we do the reset. Then we have a fine tuning period where we engage in fasting, always comfortable, always just seeing where your body is rather than forcing things to happen. So you do some fasting, you get good at metabolic flexibility. That means that you're good at burning stored energy like fat, like ketones when you need them. And then finally, you go into a focused period of nutrition nutritional ketosis that lasts for a minimum of six weeks to get the maximum metabolic benefit, these benefits that you can enjoy the rest of your life. So when you go to ketoreset.com, K-E-T-O-R-E-S-E-T.com, you can learn about the books and the cookbooks and then get a little test drive through the course with some video explanation. I think you'll really appreciate it if you're interested in keto. So check it out. And guess what? Since you're listening to me talk about this so patiently, I'm going to give you 20% off your course enrollment. Just use the code BRAD2020, BRAD20, when you check out, and that'll knock 20% off your enrollment fee. KetoReset.com. Ketoreset.com. 